These are the lecture notes for chapter 28 on invertebrates. Um, remember that invertebrates are uh, animals that do not have a vertebra um, or a backbone. They do not have um, a spine that supports the spinal cord. Um, and um, most invertebrates don't have a dorsal, well, they, none of them have a dorsal spinal nerve cord anyway. So there's a lot of differences, but the biggest thing is they don't have a backbone. Um, so we will talk about the group of an animals called the spiralians, and then the dysozoans would be the ones that um, shed their um, exoskeletons or molt. Um, and ecdysozoans only refers to invertebrates that do that. It doesn't refer to like, for example, a snake is not an ecdysozoan just because it sheds its skin. Um, it's, it's definitely a vertebrate, so it's not an ecdysozoan. So ecdysozoans are gonna include the nematodes and the arthropods. And then the deuterostomes, the invertebrate deuterostomes are going to be the um, echinoderms, which, um, includes sea stars. So their echinoderm means spiny skin. So there'll be a, a larger number of different types of animals in the spiralians. But let's go ahead and get started um, first with making sure that you know the characteristics or traits that all animals share. So one thing is all animals are multicellular. We don't have any unicellular animals. If they're unicellular and have traits similar to an animal, then we put them in the kingdom protista. So in the kingdom animalia, all of the, all the uh, organisms are multicellular and they are heterotrophs, which means that they must consume their food. They can't make their own food. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, vertebrates are animals that at some stage have a spinal cord, um, uh, well, a backbone that supports and surrounds the spinal cord, whereas invertebrates do not. Okay, so common features of animals and what we're looking at here are some, is some animal tissue. These are, this is nerve, nervous tissue, I can tell. And here you've got a bird, um, this, a carnivore, um, bird of prey, uh, or I'm sorry, a, a predator. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a cheetah and um, basically here you have a ball of cells that, that is in the early, early em, uh, embryonic stage. So we're going to move past some of this and talk about symmetry. So with animals, um, there are three types of body symmetry. Symmetry is a pattern of similarity that is observed in objects, it doesn't have to be a, a living thing. Um, but here we are talking about symmetry in the animal kingdom. So asymmetry means there's no particular body shape. And our um, example for that would be the sponges. The sponges will be the first animals that we study. And they are the simplest animals in terms of they don't have, they don't even have the tissue level of organization. They don't have true tissues. So all the other animals that we study will either have radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. So think about a jellyfish. If you could cut a jellyfish in half so that you had two identical halves, is there only one way to do that or are there many ways to do that? And the answer of course is there are many different ways that you could cut a jellyfish in half and get two identical halves. That means that so you can make a vertical cut, you can make a horizontal cut, you can make um, any number of diagonal cuts, but if you cut all the way through um, the top of the jellyfish, you just took a knife and cut all the way through and made two identical halves, there are many, many options um, or ways that you could do that. So that makes it radial symmetry. And um, what radial symmetry does is it enables an animal to reach out in all directions from one center. Bilateral symmetry is, of course, what we see in humans. That is when you have definite right and left halves in the animal. So um, all of the insects, all of the arthropods, um, insects, spiders, uh, crabs, lobsters, all of those have bilateral symmetry. 
um, that means there's one way that you can cut the animal and get um, equal symmetrical left and right halves um, or two identical halves. There's one way. And these animals that have bilateral symmetry tend to be active. They tend to move forward at an anterior end. In other words, they tend to have an, um, a head region and a tail region. The localization of the brain and sensory organs at the anterior end, that's what you tend to see with animals that have bilateral symmetry. And this is called cephalization because cephalic means head. So cephalization means that there's a head region. And you typically see that with animals that are bilaterally symmetrical. As far as development, when animals develop, the first tissue layers are called germ layers. Uh, the germ layers give rise to organs and organ systems. So if there are two tissue layers, we say that the animal is diploblastic. And we've only got two um, animal phyla that are diploblastic, and that would be the ones that include the jellyfish, which would be the um, cnidaria, and then the ones that include um, the comb jellies, which that's they're called the tenophora. So there are two diploblastic animal phyla, and that means they have two tissue layers. And the rest of the animals um, that we're going to study are triploblastic. They have three tissue layers. And when the animals are triploblastic, we characterize them as protostomes or deuterostomes. So um, what happens in embryonic development is every embryo starts out as a zygote. The zygote is the fertilized um, egg cell. That means a sperm has fertilized an egg and produced the first cell that's going to divide many times to form the, um, the organism, the adult organism. So in a protostome, well, in protostomes and deuterostomes both, that zygote begins to divide. First, it divides in half, and there are two cells, um, and then those two cells divide, and then uh, it, that keeps happening until you have a ball of cells. And that ball of cells is called a blastula. And eventually that ball of cells forms into a hollow ball of cells, and the hollow ball of cells starts to form these openings. It starts to kind of um, form these, uh, it sinks in in two areas. But the first opening that forms, the first opening that forms in protostomes becomes the mouth of the animal. But in deuterostomes, that first opening becomes the anus. It is the second opening that forms that becomes the mouth. So protostome means first mouth and deuterostome means second mouth. All right, as far as symmetry in animals, you've got radial symmetry here in this cnidarian. This, um, this is the body form of, for example, a sea anemone or a hydra. They're both in the same phylum as a jellyfish, only the tentacles are facing up instead of facing down like they do in a jellyfish. But you can see with the um, dividers that are placed here that there are many ways to get two equal halves to cut the animal and get two equal halves. So that's radial symmetry. But in this um, turtle or tortoise, what you're seeing here is that there's only one way to cut this animal in half and get equal symmetrical halves. So this animal has a head region and a tail region. Um, we call the head, uh, the, the underside region, the stomach region, I guess you could say, the ventral, and the back region is the dorsal, um, the head, is the anterior and the back is the posterior region. So these are regions you can divide an animal into um, that you um, directional terms that you can use when an animal has bilateral symmetry. So um, as far as protostomes and deuterostomes in, in development, there are more differences than just um, the openings. So in protostomes, the first opening is the mouth. In deuterostomes, the second opening is the mouth. But cleavage is what happens, remember when I told you the zygote divides, the zygote is the first cell, it divides in half, and then those cells divide in half. All the cells keep dividing in half without any overall change. The, the ball of cells that forms 
is the same size. It takes up the same amount of space as the original zygote. So we call this cleavage. The cells are cleaving. They are dividing in half, but they're not growing larger. Cell division without growth. And this happens in early, early stages of embryonic development. In protostomes, that cleavage is spiral, and in deuterostomes, that cleavage is radial. Um, and that's something you really need to see to understand, so I'm, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's just um, the way that the cells divide is a spiral cleavage in protostomes and radial in deuterostomes. The blastula is the, the um, ball of cells that forms. Um, in which that ball of cells begins to develop two openings. In protostomes, the first opening becomes the mouth. In deuterostomes, the first opening becomes the anus. The second opening becomes the mouth. And certain protostomes and all deuterostomes have a body cavity called a true coelom. And the coelom is the body cavity that holds all of the organs. Like in us, um, you know, for example, we have the thoracic and the abdominal, abdominal cavities that hold our heart and our lungs and our um, stomach and liver and intestines, you know, gallbladder. Um, that coelom is that body cavity that holds all of those organs. Okay, so protostomes... When the coelom forms in protostomes, it forms by a splitting of the mesoderm, which is the second tissue layer. And I told you that um, protostomes and deuterostomes are triploblastic. They have three tissue layers. The mesoderm is the middle tissue layer. So the coelom in protostomes forms by a splitting of the mesoderm. In deuterostomes, the coelom forms differently. It forms from the primitive gut, and the primitive gut forms from endoderm, which is the, um, in, the inside tissue layer. So you have endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. So the endoderm forms into the primitive gut or digestive tract, and the coelom forms from that primitive gut. Um, here are some images that may or may not help you understand, um, but... but this is a picture of um, spiral cleavage, and this is a picture of radial cleavage. Um, in protostomes, you can see the tissues. This kind of beige layer is the endoderm. The pink is the mesoderm, and the blue is the ectoderm. So you can see that the um, in protostomes, the coelom forms by a splitting of the mesoderm, and in deuterostomes, the coelom forms by um, an outpocketing of the primitive gut. So um, it also shows you here that in the protostome, the first opening is the mouth, and in deuterostomes, the second opening is the mouth. So that's a lot to take in. That's probably the hardest material that you have, the hardest uh, content that you have to learn in, in chapter 28. Now we're just really going to focus on the animal phyla um, that are all classified as invertebrates. And we'll start with sponges. Uh, the sponges are the simplest invertebrates. They do not have tissues. They, they lack the tissue level of organization. Um, they do have an opening called an osculum, and they have pore, pores throughout their um, body. And the pores allow water to come in, and then water moves out through the osculum. Um, sponges feed by filter feeding, and sponges are sessile as adults. Now, as uh, larvae, they're, they are able to swim. But as adults, they attach to a substrate, and they're sessile. They remain um, in place. They do not move. Um, and so it's a sponge is a sessile filter feeder. Sponges are capable of regeneration. So a piece of a sponge can break off and grow into a whole new sponge. Here are some, here's, here's the, an illustration of the body of the sponge and you can see the pores. The phylum for the sponge is called the porifera. Let's see if there's, if that's written anywhere. Mm, I don't see it. So let me write it for you, porifera. P O R I 
F E R A. All right. I think that's my first time doing that without making lines all over everything. So the sponge phylum is the porifera and the sponges do have um, pores in their body. The water goes in through the pores and then it comes up out the osculum. And while it does that, it passes along these cells called collar cells um, or coanocytes. And the collar cells have flagella and the flagella help move the water and the, the um, particles, food particles that are in the water. It helps move those particles across the surface of um, this inside surface of the sponge's body. And so um, <clears throat> there are some other cells that you see in here. Um, you see the pore, the water comes in. You see the, the collar cells that have their flagella. And they're going to be, the collar cells are going to help to um, uh, fil help the sponge to filter feed. The amoeba site is the cells that take in the food and break it down, that digest the food. And our next phylum is going to be the tenophora.